Hello and welcome to the Master Mind, Body, and Spirit Show. I'm your host, Matt Belair. Today's guest is a former Navy SEAL who endured intense amounts of physical, mental, and emotional stress as a child and during and after his military career. He has taught himself how to free his energy, body, mind, and emotions from pain by developing the emotional, physical, mental, and spiritual aspects of being. He has studied traditional Chinese medicine, the universal healing Tao system, and with Grandmaster Montauk Chia. He is the author of the book, Free for Life, A Navy Seal's Path to Inner Freedom and Outer Peace. Welcome to the show, Christopher Lee Maher. Hey, buddy. Happy to be here. Happy to have uh, what we were talking about earlier before we got on the call, a powerful, or interesting, or meaningful conversation. Absolutely. Well, I loved our our pre-chat. We kind of got carried away getting to know each other a little bit. Your book looks amazing. Uh, Your life story looks incredible. And I just really like, you know, the first little while we were chatting, we we hit on so many things I'd love to bring up in the podcast. But just to begin, why don't you update our audience with a little bit about your story, like uh, your life experience, how you got to this point where you are today with the mission that you have? Okay. Um, How did I get here? (laughs) <laughs> well, let's say I had no intent on getting here. <laughs> I was uh, serendipitously driven where I'm at. And, you know, retrospectively, I'm happy. Right? I'm grounded. Um, I'm in service. I feel good every day. And yet there was a moment when that that wasn't true. Right. And um and so my story is one of pain and discomfort followed by disassociation and followed by discovery and then hard work and effort and then consistency that led me to um, decide to shift my base state of direction and my focus on helping others versus being mostly focused on myself. And I was born in Philadelphia, 1968, right? Robert Kennedy was just assassinated a few hours before. And I came into a place that was in tragedy, you know, for black Americans, African Americans, you know, Robert Kennedy was going to be their, 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 their voice. And there was a lot of trust. There was a lot of hope. And a lot of that got snuffed out. And so I was born literally on a night where this country was in a state of intense depression and shock. And that's how I came in. And um, so that type of intensity lived in my life, right? Shock and depression. Had a woman when I was three years old decide the way to teach me to not play with matches was to turn on a gas stove and to put my hands in the fire. Oh my God. And yeah, like that's a that's that's a wake up call. That's a lot for a three and a half year old nervous system because it's an intense input of energy, right? And you know that was followed by a lot of operations, skin grafts mostly, and being gassed. You know the worst thing about getting a skin graft is you know they gash back then they used to gash you, right? So they put the black mask on your face and breathe in and before you know it you're going loopy and you're out and then you wake up and you're in a hospital room and if you lean too far to the right it hurts if you lean too far to the left it hurts and I got to spend a lot of time in hospitals healing because you know when you have open wounds like skin grafts you can't just send a kid out into the public because what happens if fungus gets in there bacteria gets in there virus gets in there so I spent a lot of time 
in hospitals building puzzles. And it benefited me because the way my mind is structured is, is very easy for me to take very complex amounts of information that are disjointed and scattered and fragmented and piece them together into a stream of thought that is coherent and deep and rich with solution. And, um, and so that's helped me in my vocation and in, in, in my profession. And so I was able to take lemons and turn them into lemonade and then teach other people how to do so. And that's really the exciting part for me. Like a, some people would say, oh, he's a coach and others would say, um, uh, he's a teacher or he's a healer. And, you know, I've got to the place in my life where I realize. I'm those things, but when you combine them all together, what I really am is a mentor, right? Like if I work with someone and I help them and I guide them and I, I um, direct them through very difficult emotional dynamics that they're dealing with, whether it's a work, whether it's a divorce, whether it's a mother who has a child who's suffering from anorexia nervosa or it's a father who has a son that has suicidal ideations or it's a wife who has a husband who's raging with anger and you know how do you navigate these kinds of things and so my history my story set me up to feel really confident to be able to help people navigate the most difficult um trying things in their lives and to do it with care and with compassion and to give them hope and inspiration and yet give them a pathway that will do what it says and says what it does. And so I've had a life that was focused on um, goals, right? Achievement, external recognition. And I use my body in such a way to get those things. And at the time, when I was in the middle of it, I had no idea that there was a cost, right? That, that I was going to pay the piper down the road because myself, like all humans, I imagine you're using your body like a skateboard, getting it to take you from one place to the next. Oh, now I'm interested in going over here. All right. Now, the skateboard takes you there and then oh i've had this experience now i want to go over there and when you're when you've been through childhood trauma like i have um and because my trauma was with fire i got to the place where i felt most comfortable when i was running my engine red hot if my engine was running red hot i felt normal and so I was always looking for more intense dynamics, more intense situations, more intense experiences to feel normal. And when I took away all that excess of heat that was baked into my body, then what I craved was the opposite. I craved things that were cool. I craved things that were chill. I craved things that were relaxed. I crave things that were spacious. I crave things that were um, effortless and graceful and easy versus craving things that are difficult and struggle and strife and that eventually, you know, led me into limiting states of belief. And my body fought back and my body said, hey, <laughs> um, I'm not going to participate. Like you can keep running this limiting belief as far to the left as this pendulum will swing, uh, but I won't. So I'm going to give you some pain that you're never going to forget. And I ended up with pain at every joint on the left side of my body. And then I was in a car accident and it went directly into the center of my hip. And then 
I could never get away from it. It didn't matter what position I laid in, what position I sat in, if I was hopping, skipping, jumping, running, rowing, no matter what I was doing, the ache and the throb was consistent, right? Ice pick in the center of your hip. Woo, woo, woo. And when you have unrelenting discomfort and pain like that, you start rethinking your strategies for life. And my strategy was hyper independence. My mom took her life when she was 29 years old. Right? She, she suffered from a word that we commonly hear today, which we never heard when I was a kid, mental illness. Right? Meaning she had things that were beyond her capacity to effectively process at an emotional level. And she had a father who, my grandfather died of cirrhosis of the liver, right? What do we say? More mental illness. And then you take to me and now I'm going through childhood trauma. And what do you think I'm dealing with? I'm dealing with some level of illness, meaning abnormality in the way that I'm processing information, in the way that I'm processing emotion, in the way that I'm processing social dynamics and i'm operating outside of a normal state of function and so the seal teams and seal training was a perfect place for me because you know it's an atypical experience right it's 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 outside of a frame of reference of of what most people are willing to sign up to experience other people are experiencing those same levels of intensity in life, but they're not signing up for them, right? They're not yelling hoorah at the <laughs> end of the day, right? Um, they're like, oh, shit, this sucks. I, I never want to do that again, right? So I signed up. I volunteered to go through SEAL training. At that time in my life, I was... Um, looking for something to challenge me. I wanted a challenge, something that would stretch me, something that would push me. And I found it and push me, they did. And the beautiful thing about SEAL training is everyone gets the same dish of shit. And so there's a certain level of respect that you have amongst teammates when you get through SEAL training and you enter into the SEAL teams and the benefit of members of the SEAL teams when new guys are entering in is they know that these guys went through the same mill that they went through. And, you know, when you have that level of respect and that level of camaraderie, you know, you can have some experiences that are quite amazing, right? And um, you're never doing these things alone because it's the SEAL teams, right? You're not going in like 007 all on his own, you got 15 other guys with you that are willing to throw down at any moment. Okay, so you're in a bar and some guy is running some jealousy and he trips you. Well, guess what? I got 13 teammates in the bar right now. Okay, we're going to lock arms, right? We're going to lock horns and we're going to throw down. If, you know, you're at your forward operating base and you're being tasked, right? Everybody's showing up to the base. You're all packing your stuff. You're getting ready to go on the flight. You're all going together, right? There's, there's, a, there's a security in knowing that you have other men who have your back that have been through the same level of intense experiences. And, you know, when you get out of that situation and you decide to enter back into the civilian life, you know, everything changes, right? Because now you, you have to find a new team. And my new team was to get back into sports. And the sports that I chose were cross country and track and field. And I had a hope, or at the time was a dream of making the Olympic trials. And in retrospect, I realized it was a fantasy, right? I had the discipline, okay? I had the effort, I had the talent, but I no longer had the body, right? Because now I'm top heavy. So instead of having thick legs and 
a small upper body. Now I got thin legs and a big upper body. And these little pencils have to carry around this big tree trunk. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and that led to a lot of injury, right? And that injury led to a lot of pain. And it was pain in my story that woke me up, caused me to question, got me to investigate, allowed me to research for my own benefit. I, I was hoping to get out of pain so that I could achieve my goal. And what happened was the inverse. I got out of pain and I was no longer interested in those goals. I was interested in different goals. I was interested in feeling happy. I was interested in feeling joyful. I was interested in feeling inner peace. I was interested in being mentally grounded. I was interested in reducing my anxiety to zero. I was interested in health and wellness versus fitness, right? I was interested in experiencing open-mindedness and feeling self-empowered. And so pain was my ticket to freedom. And fortunate for me, I'd been through a privately well boarding school, which expected a lot of me and taught me a lot of things. And I went through SEAL training and SEAL team. So I had a map, right? And the map that I was going to use is the same strategy that I applied for track and field. It's Instead, I was going to apply it to heel training instead of seal training. And I got down and I got dirty and I worked like a dog. And every day I learned something else new about the inner world, about the emotional world, about psychology, about energetics, about chakras, about Nadi, about um, the solar system, the galaxy, the universe you know, metaphysics, physics, biology, astronomy, astrology, human design. Like I was looking under every rock, every stone and every fallen tree in the woods to find solutions. Cause you know, once you get on that path and instead of having fleeting, experiencing fleeting states of intense joy and happiness, you're feeling them on like a regular basis. You want to feel them more, right? So I, I got greedy. <laughs> <laughs> I got real greedy. And when I got greedy, I got vested, right? And I started thinking, how far could I push this? And so I told myself, look, let's get after it. Let's get after it for seven years. Because once I started studying exercise physiology and, I st and biology and I started to learn about the body, you know, there's this thing that I learned that says um, it takes seven years to replace every cell in the body. And so logically to me, I thought, well, if it takes seven years to replace every cell in the body. I want this joy. I want this happiness. I want this peace. I want this groundedness. I want these elevated emotions in every single cell. I'm on this for seven years straight and I got after it. And I mean, five, six hours a day, I built my life around it. And when I wasn't doing it to myself, I was doing it to others. And while I was doing it to myself and doing it to others, I was figuring out new ways of how to do it. And then I was creating. And now, you know, the artist turned on inside of me and I created healing art that were profound and, you know, intensely um, appropriate to the needs and the desires of those who were showing up on my doorstep, seeking help and guidance and support. And every week, my mind was expanding and deepening. Every week, my emotions were getting more grounded. Every week, my mind was getting more quiet. My energy was getting more abundant. My body was getting more comfortable. And I became a very fierce steward for change. And I knew for me, the most important aspect of change 
was for me to change myself from the inside out. And once I realized that I could get, I got a ticket out of hell, I got delivered a golden ticket. I spent every dime. I spent every nickel on waking up and getting to a place where I could provide opportunities that no one else in the world could provide. And then at some point, you know, I met someone who said, hey, would you teach me how to do this? And I thought, hmm, is this what I really want to be doing? And I thought, no, initially, that's not what I want to be doing. And so then I said to him, listen, if you're willing to do everything that I tell you in the way that I tell you, then yes, I'll teach you. But the first moment that you don't, we're done. Because why am I going to waste my time, right? I could be using my time and energy and effort helping people who wanted to grow beyond their limitations. And that turned into me building out systems of education and creating vocations for people who wanted to create profound impact in other people's lives in ways that no one else can. And, um, you know, true body intelligence is what I call my work. And, you know, that's, that's the public domain. And then the private domain is rational, intimate transfiguration. And so my pain from my history set me up to serve those who, who weren't in a position to defend their own boundaries because they were under the tutelage and influence of adults who were absent either psychologically, they were absent mentally, they were absent energetically, and often dealing with intense levels of discomfort and pain and creating a very challenging environment for a child to be raised in. And so I have been able to spend the last 23 years mapping out how trauma comes in, what it does, and how to reduce it and then teach others to do so with very simple tools that anyone can implement that are repeatable and verifiable by anyone. And after I finished that seven years, guess what I did? I took seven years off. In those seven years, I said, look, I'm not going to be working on myself because I knew in order for me to know if it really worked, I'd have to invest as much time away from it as I did into it to see if the changes were permanent and instantaneous. And guess what? They are. Now, who can stand on the rock and say that? I can. Why? I spent 100,000 hours doing it. So a lot of people... They're good messengers, right? They got a great message. And then other people become the message, right? My motto for the people that I work with and the people that I train and teach and coach, you got to become the message. Like if you're interested in being a messenger, like put the mic down, like become the thing you're talking about. Because when you become it, you don't have to talk about it anymore. The, the, the impact of your presence alone creates the change that you desire to see, right? So the change that you create alone generates the presence that creates the impact that you want to see. And so then you no longer need symptoms, not symptoms, you no longer need systems to resolve symptoms. People can simply sit in your presence and reality changes, right? Because you got those high vibes going. And when the, vi the vibratory rates get higher, they move faster. And when you get with someone who's a slower and denser, because all nervous systems orientate to the highest functioning nervous system in the collective field, when they're in your vibe, their vibe matches your vibe. The same way if you start perusing around with others who are um, um, 
who are choosing to grow through negative benefit because then you too will be surrounded by really dense individuals and before you know it you'll be choosing to grow through negative benefit wow well <clears throat> that was one of the greatest uh introductions i think i've had for a guest in a long time it's going to be up there in my top five for just profound story in the way that you're able to articulate your journey. And I'm so curious on the process and the how to, and how do I get to that level of embodiment? Because you shared a lot of profound wisdom just in sharing your story. You know, one, one of them that I wrote no, a note with um, is, you know, becoming the messenger, being more powerful. And it, I think, I can't remember what the law is called, but maybe the law of resonance where a lower resonance will, will automatically be raised to a higher resonance. And I can give an analogy that may or may not work as I'm thinking about it. It's like the idea of if you're an embodied, and I'm a man, so I'm an embodied man that is like physically capable and powerful and peaceful. And I've mastered my body. I've mastered my craft. There's a lower man comes in disturbing the peace and I'm there and we have words or I'm just in that presence, he might just knock it off. You know what I mean? Because he doesn't have that same level. I don't have to even say anything. You know, it's just like, knock it off. I'm not going to do anything, but you also can't continue this because you know what's going to have happen. There's going to be a point where it has to be stopped. You know, it's a very rudimentary example, but I think in the vibrational, uh, in the vibrational world, there is this law of resonance where the higher resonance or the lower resonance gets absorbed into the higher resonance, which I think is profound. There's so yeah. many ways that we could, uh, you want to just add on to that? Yeah. What I wanted to add to that is that um, if I simplify it, if you took 30 clocks from 30 homes around your neighborhood and you put them in your garage, what you'll notice is that they all tick to a very different talk and they all talk to a very different tick. When you come back three days later, every one of those clocks will all be ticking to the same talk. And so what we're talking about is resonance, right? Well, mostly what we're talking about is resonance plus coherence, right? So if I'm in a greater state of magnetic coherence, everything around me comes into a greater state of resonance relative to my individual state of coherence. Yep. I agree. I love that. And there's, there's a lot of different ways I want to take this. I have a million questions going through my mind here. I'm always curious about the, how we, when we were having our discussion at the beginning, uh -huh. you were talking about going to the Super Bowl and just seeing people. And you're like, you know, it's like 15 minutes. I could help these people with, with their issues. And I'm curious, we've got a certain group of people who are dealing with trauma. And I think a lot of people are, We've got a lot of people who deal with imposter syndrome or not feeling good enough, not feeling wor worthy. We have a mm -hmm. lot of people who feel disconnected from God and the creator and in victim consciousness. Um, mm -hmm. And we have a certain group of people probably not listening to this podcast, but are deeply in service to self as you were as a young man. And, and it's not a good or bad thing. It's maybe a part of the process. But if you're deeply in service to self, it's harder to have this greater fulfillment, in my point of view, to have this greater connection and this greater joy, because it, there is a bigger picture to that. So I'm curious, how do you help people at the beginning who are, who are starting maybe the most challenging thing with trauma? that you've experienced in your life to overcome that because it was, it's been interesting in my work to see and work with older people. When I was younger, I didn't think I'd work with anybody older than me, but it was weird how older people would want my advice and opinion. And I could never figure out why. And it was always fascinating that it would be a childhood thing that we would go back to that we would visit. And they're like, I haven't thought about that in 40 years. I haven't thought about this in 30 years, you know, and they just shove it in this corner. And it's still this unconscious pattern that you're running. And we just go through a very simple process. There's a few different ones that I would use that are not that complicated just to try to um, take away that energy. Like when you talked about the central nervous system of your mother putting the hand on the stove, you know, that's such a profound experience the energy is so high it's going to lock into the body and sure. you need to discharge that you need to you need yeah. to basically have a an opposing energy to make it yeah. neutral again otherwise yeah. it's always going to be there really 
skewing the lens of how you perceive every interaction in your life and how you make decisions. And so for you to be able to overcome that, I'd be curious how you support people in that process. And if they want to get on this path of, of change, and even if they're not at that higher level, just this path of kind of like releasing the weights is like, we want to move freely in life. We want to move in joy and peace and contentment and faith. And fear is a big one as well. And so kind of threw a lot at you, but maybe you can kind of pick away and, and, and answer it as you wish. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, as I go over my history of working with people, I think the thing that I'm very good at is making people feel secure. Right. And the reason why the work starts, even when I'm not present, is because all time is now is a very common concept that people are talking about. But what people don't understand is that all space is now. And what I mean by that is that um, even if a person is in Tennessee and I'm on the phone, I'm right there beside them. And so my level of coherence already starts working with them. And the moment they hear my voice, they always feel more safe. And then I reinforce it and I listen and I go, look, I got your back. Don't even worry about it. We're going to sort this out. And I say it in such a way in a in a way that's very flippant, right? And confident. And to some people from the outside, they may make the assumption that it's arrogant. And yet the truth is, I know it in my heart, we're going to sort this out. And it's going to be very simple. And once people have that rapport, and they have that trust with me, they already start shedding the fear because they're with someone who's been through every form of abuse that you can be through by the time he was seven years old. And so there's no, there's no greater level of abandonment than your mother committing suicide. That's the greatest level of abandonment that you can ever feel. There's no greater level of physical trauma outside of death that you can feel besides some babysitter deciding to put their your hands inside the fire on a gas stove when you're three and a half okay there's no greater shock to come into your nervous system than being seven years old and get hit by an oncoming car and get knocked into a coma do you know what I mean like these are the levels of extremes that I was dealing with. And so when you're in the presence of someone who has transcended um, rudimentary levels and complex levels of stress, tension, distortion, and fear, um, you know that everything is possible. Hey, buddy, I don't mean to cut you off, but your mic is rubbing on your sweater there. So you're getting a little bit of... Uh, okay. It's right by your neck. So there's like a little rustle in Got between it. Okay. your profound wisdom. So I'd rather, okay. <laughs> so I want everybody listening here to, to hear that resonance. And I'll just add in quickly. I what what you're doing, I think, is rare because you have this big trust in people. I think there's a lot or, or you have a you have a mastery that allows for all of these experiences to happen. And that's a rare thing because even in a world where you have a loving parent and you're going through a, an issue, that knowing that they have or you have their undivided support and uh, help and anything you need gives a profound level of comfort and healing just alone, just knowing they're there. So yeah. to provide that for someone and also to go through it is incredibly powerful. So please continue. Yeah, you, you know, you bring up a good point, because those are the things that weren't provided for me. You know, I, after my mother committed suicide, I remember uh, standing by an old red truck in my grandmother's yard, and my uncle coming up to me saying, hey, look, you know, I got some I got some bad news, you know, we're going to be putting you um, in a foster care system. 
And I remember feeling all this pain in my heart. And I thought, wow, he never asked me if I was okay. No one ever said, hey, Christopher, is this going to be okay for you? Like, what, what would you like? Are you going to be okay sleeping on the living room floor in a sleeping bag? Or would you rather go into foster care where you may be able to sleep in your own bed? And they, if they had asked me that question, I would have said, look, just give me a sleeping bag in the attic. I'll be totally fine. I'm hanging with family. And I remember when I went to boarding school, the one thing when I look back, I realized that my house parents or my coaches or teachers were hardly ever asking me like, hey, how are you doing? And because no one was ever asking me how I was doing, I wasn't asking myself because it was never being modeled for me. And so I think a lot of times that the things that you don't get define the man or the woman that you're going to be. You know, my brother, um, you know, dad wasn't around. Mom committed suicide. He's three and a half years old. We're having Christmas. I think at this point he was like six. And they ask him what he wants for Christmas. And my brother says, I want a family. And what did my brother do, right? He met a really lovely woman and committed his life to her and their children. And he's like, he's, a, he's an amazing dad. And he gives his kids all the things that he didn't get. And so I have luckily had the opportunity to impact people by giving them the things that I probably was craving, right? You know, and when you're in boarding school, yeah, there might be other kids around. Typically, in most student homes that I was in, there were 16 kids. There were two house parents. Most of them had one or two children of, of their own. So there's what? There's 19 people in the household. Imagine being in a home with 19 other people and you feel lonely. Because no one's having a meaningful conversation with you. Think about that. You're feeling lonely because no one's willing to have a meaningful conversation. And a meaningful conversation that time would have been, hey, how are you doing? Let's talk about how you're processing things. Does this feel fair to you? Does this feel unfair to you? And why? Like no investigation at an interpersonal level. And of course, what's that going to lead to? That's going to lead to recognition externally. Because I got to figure out some way to prove that I have value because I'm missing the tenderness and the affection and the attention and the connection that a child growing up in a normal household would at least have some semblance of experiencing. Even if mom and dad were absent a lot of the time, they were at least present some of the time. And so I'm happy we're having this conversation today because it's giving me insight into the depth of uh, separation that I was living in. And so the fire, right? The, the hands on the gas stove led to deep levels of separation and internal loneliness. And as I started to, you know, transmute that tension and that stress, I was more available for people. It was easier for me to share out loud all of the tragic experiences that I had. And as I did that, I was no longer a victim to my circumstances because I realized that logically, the man that I am today is because of the things that I experienced, right? Like we are the sum of all of our experiences, both good and bad, both difficult and easy, both simple and complex. And here I was, and I shifted this complex, difficult, um, 
negative experience into something that was positive, easy, and profound. And all it took were some very simple things. I had, I reached out, right? I bent the knee, I reached out for someone and I asked for help. And fortunate for me, the first person that I asked for help said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna come help you. And they brought, a, they brought over a yoga mat and a juicer. And I began to find out really quickly that I was, inflexible, I was dense, I was stiff, and I was toxic. And they were malleable, and they were flexible, and they were light, and they were healthy. And we both went through SEAL training, we both spent time in the SEAL teams, and they're having a profoundly different experience. He's drinking carrot juice, and I'm drinking Jägermeister. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> he's in a meaningful committed relationship and i'm spending time with women i don't know and so these contrasting reflections helped me wake up right? Start to see where the real value was. And the thing that I love about it most is it's very simple. The more tent, more, the more stress that you have that's unresolved, right? And that's stored in your body and your brain and your nervous system. It manifests as actual physical tension in your muscle, in your fascia, in your bones, in your ligaments, and in your tendons, and in your organs right? Your brain, your liver, your gallbladder, your pancreas, your stomach, your spleen, your kidneys, your bladder, your sexual organs, you get tense. So you go from being stressed to being tense. And then you need a, ma you need a massive amount of tension to create a little bit of distortion. And so now you got structural distortion. And when you got structural distortion, you have pain in your joints. Anyone listening on the call, I want you to hear me very clearly. If you have pain in your joints, whether it's your fingers or your toes, your knees, your elbows, your back, or your wrist, or your neck, you have a massive amount of tension in your body, in the muscle below or the muscle above that joint. And if you remove that massive amount of tension that's creating that tiny bit of distortion, that level of discomfort and stiffness and throbbing pain or, or dull ache that you feel is going to disappear overnight. So when you've got pain, you have direction because your pain, my pain, was directing me outward to seek help, to find somebody at least who knew more than all of these other people knew. And look, I tried it all. I put my energy and effort in. I spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of resources. And if I needed to go a mile, they took me an inch. Yeah, I enjoyed that inch. I was happy. I was grateful for that inch. And then one day, I realized that there has to be more. Somebody has to know more. And fortunate for me, I had somebody I went to boarding school with, sent me an email, and he led me to a guy that knew more. And I devoted my life to learning from him for you know two years and three months. And that was a start of something really magical. And so when I work with people, and I start with them. I start with being myself and building rapport because I'm already in the place where they want to be, right? They want to have a body that's comfortable. They want a mind that's quiet. They want emotions that are peaceful and grounded. And they want an abundant amount of energy. Like who would want anything less than that? 
So when you're in the presence of someone that has it, your presence and your nervous system is already communicating with their presence and their nervous system. And they're going, oh my God, there's a way out of hell. And this guy has figured it out. And, you know, I had a young woman, you know, in her 50s show up this week, early 50s. And she said, I knew as soon as I sat down in your chair, I was going to start crying. And she sat down, she started crying. Because it wasn't me, it was the presence, right? It's like what you were talking about earlier, and I was talking about earlier. Either you can be a messenger, or you can become the message. And when you are the message, there's no system needed. All you need is your presence and your heart and your love and your care. And the tears will start to flow. And when the tears flow, the healing begins, right? Because every bit of dis-ease in anyone's life or let's say every bit of dis-ease that was in my life was being catalyzed by limiting belief. Every bit was being catalyzed by limiting belief. Well, what helped me create that limiting belief? The intense traumas that I went through, because guess what? My mind was still in a precognitive state of function. What does a three and a half year old know about reality? What is a three and a half year old supposed to make up about the babysitter that's supposed to care for them, putting their hands on a gas stove and then having a break from reality and then putting Vicks vapor rub on their burns, right? There's cruel and then there's unusual, right? Um, punishment you know what does a three and a half year old know about that they don't know anything so they start making up things about reality that are false and every thing that i made up that was false created more stress more tension and more distortion in my body my brain and my nervous system and the same thing is true for every human alive when you employ, when I employ, when we employ limiting beliefs, falsehoods, it goes against what's called coherence. So a falsehood, a limiting belief, is an incoherent thought. It's fragmented. And so fragmented, incoherent thoughts produce fragmented, incoherent bodies, emotions, energy, and communication styles that are never that are unsatisfactory and dissatisfying so anyone who has a symptom like a headache or um intense menstrual cramps or achy feet or a stiff back or a foggy mind or whatever your symptom is the pathway is the same for every state of dis-ease. And what I figured out is the map and the pathway. And then I figured out how to reverse engineer the pathway and turn darkness back into light. And that's a trick. Well, that's profound. I want to know the pathway. You're going to tell me the pathway. You're going to leave me out. Do we need to do? There's so many questions <laughs> I want to ask you. So, you know, you've got this process. That's the trauma. Um, when you're talking about being in someone's presence and them crying, I've had that experience similar in coaching before. Um, just, I think for me, it was just like listening to people like, oh, you know, the idea, like you're really easy to talk to kind of stuff. And it may come from, mirror neurons or coherence or whatever they want to say there is something to it so i can see that so the questions i have a lot of questions but are you gonna i'd love to know the pathway does somebody need a guide to go through i think a lot of times guides and mentors can accelerate the process greatly um i love how you talked about you know somebody with more deep and profound knowledge because there's a lot of 
entry level knowledge and then people will read it but then then they won't integrate it and then there's you know i think there's levels of mastery that people really integrate it and for me training with the shallow monks that was one of them the reason why i wanted to see can these people really break stone and brick and i found out about charlatans people who do tricks people who claim to do all these things and then i realized how they did it was years of following a simple but ruthless and brutal process of self-inquiry and understanding the energy systems and the medical physical world and all that uh kind of thing so i'd be curious can you share any kind of process if somebody feels like they are alone and then you also talk about the fight or flight state of mind and uh redefining success and and i'm curious because you've got this one side of life where you struggle with your limitations beliefs and traumas and maybe you have these goals where you said your goals changed, where you're like, oh, I need you know money and this and this and this. And then you're like, oh, well, I actually need these other things. And so on the other side, is it this state of peace and coherence with like a driving force from, you know, whether you want to call it God, where you know what your mission is and that's what motivates you. It's not just like hunky dory. You're just sitting there and on a cloud, it's like, oh, you know what? I have this gift that I really want to bring to people. And I'm driven to bring that. And I feel like that's kind of tipping to the other side of an awakened or, or an enlightened person. You know, they have a mission to bring, but they've also found a way to be peaceful. And in one way, I've also seen it recently is when I talk to people of unwavering faith, when I look at the world and all the issues and all the things that really bother me and all the things that concern me in my own life and the way we move forward, it always inspires me to talk to somebody of complete faith. They're like, you know, God has this, right? This is, that's a great, that God has this and I'm doing my role here, but I have no fear of anything outside of me. And I think that's a very powerful uh, place to be in. And you're also in a more creative state where the trauma victim fear is a, um, what's that word? Like state frozen state, you know, fight, flight, or freeze. You're not creating. So you're not really in your power as a, as a creator and you're not feeling joy and peace. That's for sure. Yeah, um, so we'll we'll cover this in sections, and then we'll relate it to a pathway. I think that would be helpful. Um, so if we break it down, I'm my mind is scientific, but my heart is spiritual and emotional, and so I will blend some of these strategies because you know some some of your listeners are going to be on a different wavelength. And so I think it's important to understand first the mechanics of something. And when you're looking at a fight or flight state, in order to get into your initial fight or flight state, a child needs to have an event, right? They're crawling towards the corner of the coffee table. Mom's in the kitchen doing dishes. She gets an instinctual hit and then she yells out, Jake! right before his head hits the corner, right? And what happens is she uses shock, her voice, as a means of controlling his environment. And the moment that he goes into that control strategy, meaning that he never wants to feel the shock again, and so then what he does is he no longer takes risk, right? So now he becomes risk averse. And when you become risk averse, you're actually becoming less coherent, right? Because reality is about risk. Meaning if you want to learn anything, you have to get off your butt, right? Either go to the library, go to your computer, you have to invest some energy. And so when you have a child that grows up in an environment where they've been scolded again and again and again and again, it locks their nervous system into an inappropriate stress state that I would call the protective mode. When you're in the protective mode, you have less blood going to your brain and more blood stuck in your guts. And when you have more blood in your guts, what you're experiencing are overwhelming states of anxiety. And then you're going to do anything and everything you can to arrest that state of anxiety so you can move back into a state of normality and so what people are looking for is a pattern interrupt how do you interrupt the pattern that this child learned because imagine 
this child wants to avoid the mom yelling at him. So the child is going to astutely create a strategy to avoid punishment, rejection, humiliation, violence, discomfort, and pain. And they're going to do everything they can to do that. And so everyone in their life has a moment where the feathers were ruffled further than what the child could process effectively. The challenge is when a child is in a precognitive state of function, the child doesn't understand context. Like it understands, oh my goodness, here's the paddle or there's the candy. I want that taste. But they don't understand what it took to get that candy. They don't understand, well, mom had to go to the store, dad had to earn the money, or dad had to go to the store and mom had to earn the money. They don't understand the context of everything involved in order for that candy to end up in that bowl. And so children are left up to make up things about reality that are completely false. And then the false things that we make up, those limiting beliefs, as we engage and use them as a strategy to avoid punishment, rejection, humiliation, pain, and discomfort, we create what's called our winning strategy for life. And as you continue to apply that, because it's being catalyzed by fear, it will eventually produce a symptom of pain at some point in your life. And if you ignore the first few symptoms that come to you, the symptoms will only increase. They'll switch to a different part of the body and they'll get more intense. And then, hey, guess what? It might disappear for three months, but when it comes back, it's coming back stronger and it's going to be somewhere else. And, you know, for me, as someone who's really loved sports and athleticism and movement and martial arts and all those kinds of things, when you get an injury, and I'm sure you've had injuries, right? I'm sure the listeners have had injuries. People have used their bodies consistently. Now your body starts to compensate. Well, guess what happens when your body's compensating, your mind's compensating. When your mind's compensating, your emotions are compensating. When your emotions compensating, your energy's compensating. And when you get into these compensatory states of function, now you are storing massive amounts of stress, tension, and distortion. Okay, even greater states. And the challenge is this, is it becomes exponential. And your intermittent levels of discomfort, they become chronic. And if they get too chronic, like someone who has diabetes, hey, maybe they'll have to remove your feet, right? Maybe they'll have to cut out six inches of your colon. Maybe they'll have to remove a foot and a half of your small intestine, right? That's like extreme, okay? But the most extreme state of dysfunction is death, right? And so the pathway is simple. Limiting beliefs or traumatic events, and all children have experienced them because we've all experienced some level of punishment. And when you punish a child that doesn't understand context, they don't understand why you're punishing them right? Like every adult that's listening to call, every parent right now that's listening to call, you have a small child, you have to understand your child's mind is in a precognitive state of function. In order for you then to understand context, you have to teach them context. Or they will continue to subscribe to the limiting beliefs of a three and a half year old child. And then they will take those limiting beliefs and they will cast them into their adulthood like a net that's gathering fish. And the world will provide dynamics where the fish that they caught will be a reward. The problem is all those rewards that they're getting are coming from a falsely casted net that was built on the limiting beliefs of a three and a half mind year old child. Now, obviously, go back and listen to that portion of the call again till you really grok the concept of what I'm saying, because it's extremely important. 
And when you can catch yourself in the middle of your discomfort, in the middle of applying your strategy, you're going to create a pattern interrupt. And so maybe someone's strategy is me and my wife have an argument. I go to the bank account or the ATM. I take out $60. I go down to the bar and I drink with the boys and throw darts, right? And I ignore everything that she was telling me because emotionally I'm overwhelmed because now my wife represents my mom and she's raising her voice at me. So now I'm shutting down and my winning strategy for life is to ignore and not communicate. And now guess what? He comes back from the bar, he crawls into bed, he goes to sleep, wakes up the next morning, boom, same thing happens all over again three, three weeks later. And this pattern starts to build in their relationship. And then one day she wakes up and she goes, look, I just can't do this anymore. I can't do it. We're starting to have a conversation. You get triggered. You walk out, you slam the door behind you, and then you come back at, at one o'clock in the morning. Yeah, you're pleasant the next day, but we're still back at the same old story that hasn't been resolved. And so what he has to do is in the moment of his reaction, he has to catch himself when he's going to apply his strategy, like his hand is on the door and he's got it six inches open, he's got to stop and he's got to close the door and he's got to turn around and he's got to walk over to his wife and go, look, I'm overwhelmed. And then she goes, huh? I'm overwhelmed. I don't know how to respond to what you're saying. I want to run away right now because his strategy is flight. His wife's strategy is fight. And so then he takes the step to do what? To interrupt the pattern. It doesn't even matter what's said after that. Even if, they res if nothing gets resolved, what matters is he interrupted the pattern. He got to the crossroad and instead of turning left, he turned right. He moved towards turning left. He almost made it all the way left. And then he realized, uh-oh, I'm getting ready to apply my strategy. You know what? I'm going to be courageous. I'm going to get vulnerable. And I'm going to figure this out. And he simply says, honey, I'm overwhelmed. Because he doesn't know what he's doing. This is a subconscious pattern that was developed by a three and a half year old child in a precognitive state of function. And guess what? Your cognitive mind never has access to your subconscious mind. It's not allowed to. Imagine if your conscious mind had access to your subconscious, you would be in trouble. Okay? So that's, that is quarantined off. But the way that you get to catch it is when you're triggered. And so what you're looking for is people in your life who trigger you because they're your greatest gift. They're the ones that get you to go, uh-oh, here's my strategy. Oh, it came up again. What am I going to do now? And then once he says he's overwhelmed and he drops into that state of vulnerability, he now turns his conscious mind into an ally to go, hey, you know what? Why, why are we overwhelmed? Let's go seek some help. And the wife is like, look, I, I, I'm happy you didn't walk out the door, but I'm still pissed. And he goes, honey, I'm overwhelmed. Well, I know you keep saying the same thing, but I'm still angry at the fact that you come home you lay your shoes wherever you want. I ask you to help with the dishes afterwards. You always say the same old thing. I just got off work and my back hurts. <laughs> Honey, I'm overwhelmed. And then once he says it about the sixth or seventh time, you know what's going to happen? She's going to go, oh my God. He's overwhelmed. He is stressed the fuck out. What can I do? Now she becomes an ally. 
because you stepped into a state of vulnerability. Well, guess what? The three and a half year old child couldn't say to his mom. He couldn't say, hey, mom, I'm overwhelmed when you raise your voice at me. Because three and a half year old children do not know how to communicate their desires, wants, and needs at an emotional level. At a survival-based level, yes, I'm hungry. I need some milk. <laughs> mommy, I'm hungry. Versus, mommy, you hurt my feelings, right? So at an emotional level, because his emotional development hasn't begun yet. And so the strategy is simple. When you're overwhelmed, turn around and tell the other person when you're ready to employ your strategy that you're overwhelmed and I don't know why. I'm overwhelmed and I don't know why. And then you've got to find someone that will help you create a pattern interrupt. And then once you do that, you're now moving into the greatest state of freedom that you can. You're stepping into a state of inner honesty and outer honesty simultaneously. And if you can be in inner honesty and outer honesty simultaneously, you can mend that fragmented aspect of your consciousness. And wow. how will you, whoa. <laughs> I, didn't keep going. I just hear, you want to keep going? <laughs> no, 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 please, please. Wow. Please. Yeah, man. Uh, all your answers are, are really profound and uh, just very simple stories and, and hitting a level of depth and understanding, like applying a simple tactic, but the story really illustrating a very deep level of knowledge of the solution. And so what I'll ask as a question because each of the questions I ask lead to a really profound answer. So we'll let you draw this one out. And so I'll, I'll throw the kitchen sink at you and let you come back with it. You know, I'd be curious your perception of how does an individual, in essence, reach, you could call it enlightenment, but their life purpose, you know, the, this holistic way of being where they are in balance, you know, you've got families, you've got kids, you're stressed about money, you want to, uh, you know, make a meaningful impact, you might not know what to do. How do you address that journey of an individual? Maybe they're maybe they're going through a midlife crisis, or maybe they're a younger person looking to define their life, or maybe they're working a, a job and and maybe they'll transition out of that job into something more meaningful, or maybe they just need to stay in the job and find the meaning within their family. The question is, is this connection with, with God and self where they do have that genuine peace that you're speaking of, and they have this balance of inner and outer honesty and faith, you know, and, and their life is in balance. Cause I feel like there's this, um, balance between growth of like, okay, for me, I'd like to grow certain areas of my life to provide more for my family. And there's a lot that I'm grateful for. And there's stuff that I'm still striving for. I'm still growing as an individual and I can see things that I'm proud of myself for. And I can see, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, what it, not inconsistencies, but uh, what's the word like just lack, you know, like things I can prove greatly, uh, you know, so in that journey, my intention is often, how do I continue in that process? I used to want to speed up the process more. How can I get to enlightenment fast, right? That's why I went to Nepal to meditate with Tibetan monks. I was aiming for Tibet, but you can't go there because they're still occupied by China. So I was like, oh, I'll go get enlightened. That'll be great. And it didn't work. Still me. <laughs> Uh, but you know, that's, that's the kind of question, right? If I can live a day in joy and peace and contentment and gratitude and know that I'm, I'm doing meaningful work, knowing that my life is aligned, that's when I'm in a very powerful state. And it would be great to see that in more people, because I think a lot of people are fractured and they're not congruent with themselves. They have no relationship with God or spirit or whatever they want to call it. And I feel like that's where they have this deep, deep loneliness and other things that come from that. And I'd just be curious your thoughts on that rant of living a life purpose, being in balance and being in gratitude as we grow. Because some people, <clears throat> I'd, I'd be curious your thoughts on this, especially with the way finances are going in the world. 
they're in lack, they're in a challenge, they're in, they can't pay the bills and they're scared and they don't know how they're going to make ends meet. So you have all that real life world stuff mixed with that peaceful mindset. And that's where the faith will kind of come. It's like, it's going to be okay, <laughs> but is it going to be okay? You know, holy smokes, what a challenge we face. And yeah, be curious on that rant. I could add more, yeah. but leave it there. <laughs> yeah. Um you bring up a lot of good points and th there there's a lot of meat on the bone, right? And I think the thing I would want the listeners to know is that all the things you're talking about have been going on for 10,000 years, right? And the difference is now, the difference now is this, is if you were in Pennsylvania and you grew up in the either an Irish household or an Italian household or Polish household, um guess what there might be nine people living in that house together right and of those nine people six of them might be adults and you've got six people providing for the household and so as we've uh, fractured the family unit individuals are responsible for more than they used to ever be okay and so the stress is more complex because you have less unification and less support at the familial level. And of course, South America, they slow things down a bit, like kids will stay home till they're in their thirties. You know, um, they move into being uh, promiscuous, uh, promiscuous, sexual, much, much later in life. You know, they develop in a different way. And I live in America and was raised in America. And as you add more pressure, there's greater opportunity for fractures. And the more fractured someone, be someone becomes, the greater opportunities that they have to mend those fractures. Because from my experience in life, pain and loss and discomfort are life's three greatest teachers. Okay. And you know, my initial wish for people is, yeah, like you're uncomfortable, great. Now we got a direction. How do we solve the discomfort, right? Because how are you gonna get to light if you refuse to acknowledge your darkness? How can you ever get to light without acknowledging your darkness? And if you can acknowledge it, hey, maybe the justice system can do it for you. What I mean by that is this, you've got a 19 year old kid, he's at a college party, uh, he's been inconsistent in school, he's drank a little too much, he knows not to get in his car, guess what, he decides to. And turns on the engine, hits the gas, falls asleep at the wheel, mile away from his home, and runs into another car, kills a family, okay? Well, guess what? The system is now going to wake him up because he's going to have to look at the shadow and the darkness, and he's going to have to look at the inconsistency, and he's going to have to look at the, at the immaturity because now he's a consequence. And those consequences for our choices, those are the ones that are catalysts for change to shift from any level of darkness, any level of shadow into light and when you look at some of the words that i hear people using today like evil what you have to understand is evil is subjective and when when it comes down to metaphysics what we're talking about is the absence the absolute absence of light okay the absolute absence of light and how do you get from darkness or shadow behavior into light? If I were to find a gentleman that was 42 years old, like you were talking about, has wife, has kids, struggling financially, got relieved from work, the simplest thing to do is to reach out and ask for help, right? You go to your neighbors, you go to your friends, and you go, hey, look, I, I, I need to get vulnerable with you. I'm not going to be able to pay my bills this month. Would you be able to lend me $10? Right? And you go to the next door and you go, would you be able to lend me a dollar? 
and you do whatever you can and you lean on the humans around you to support you. And when you get into a state of humility and you bend the knee, what you're saying is, I'm worthy of love. And most humans have no idea that they're worthy of love. They're worthy of support because the survival-based strategies that we implement and employ are so sophisticated, okay, that they convince us continuously that we are separate and different from the other. And the truth is, we're living in oneness. When you win, I win. When you get light, I get more light. When you get more shadow, I get more shadow. When another man kills another woman, we all lose, right? You don't feel it because of your lack of sensitivity energetically, but we all lose. When someone climbs that, that high mountain and succeeds, we all win. And so once you get into the understanding that everything that I do and everything that I think and all the ways that I'm being have everlasting impact, you then have the opportunity to make different choices. And if you're struggling and you're in stress and you're overwhelmed, reach out and ask for help. Because I know as a man, you know, we've been taught one way, like right? hyper masculinity. I rode that train. I was good on that train. And that train took me as far as it could take me. And then I had to get on another train and turn on another aspect of myself because I was outside of a state of receptivity. And even though I had all that pain in my body, even though I was struggling with my vision, even though I was struggling with my hearing, I was still refusing to ask for the level of help that I needed. I was unwilling to acknowledge um, my defeats so that I could get assistance. Because, you know, when you ask for assistance, you're being vulnerable. What could be more greater than being vulnerable? Okay, because no one is meant to do it alone. If you're meant to do it alone, you would be on a planet all by yourself. Well, the data proves that that belief is false because we have seven and a half plus billion people on the planet. So obviously, you're not meant to do it alone. And so... I know that it's easy to get caught up in a state of hyper-independence because that makes you feel safe, right? To be self-reliant. And, you know, men, we have been taught to be self-reliant at an emotional level. And reaching out and asking for help as a man feels like you're not being a man, okay? You know, women are more capable of asking for help, right? Because the yin energy, the feminine energy, it's naturally more receptive. It is a normal state of function for them. And yet, guess what? You have two hemispheres of your brain. One is masculine and one is feminine. You have two sides of your body. One is masculine, one is feminine. Yet we've been conditioned as men to value the masculinity and to devalue the femininity when it comes to ourselves. And so we get stuck in extended states of fight or flight and inappropriate stress states that lead to varying states of disease. And we know this to be true. How do we know? Because men die before women. Men die before women. You can attempt to ignore that data, but the data shows that a state of reps, a state of a consistent state of receptivity leads to a longer life. Okay. Well, the more incoherent I am, meaning as a man, if all my energy is towards the masculine and I refuse to develop any bit of the feminine, I'm always left to do it on my own. I get great satisfaction from that. And you can have that life. Wonderful. You can be great at it. And yet ultimately, if there's more there to experience, meaning that when I am able to take a feminine perspective on reality, meaning that 
everything that I do affects the whole tribe. I'm able to consider my actions. And when I am considering my actions, I'm becoming more aware. And when I increase my self-awareness, I'm now a greater resource to my community. I'm a greater resource to my family because I can make better decisions to the benefit of everyone. When I'm solely focused on my own mission and my own task and in a hyper state of self-reliance, I reduce my ability to be effective for the community as a whole, as a more complete person. And so if somebody has a desire to reach a high state of balance or experience some level of enlightenment or wakefulness or increased levels of consciousness or awareness, they need to know some basic information, right? Like the, 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 the most basic level of spiritual information would be you have a body that's connected to four worlds. Each one of these worlds has a high state of function. The mental world is about awareness, okay? Which can be increased through meditation. The spiritual world is about what? It's about enlightenment, okay? Honoring and coming into alignment with my creator and honoring the sacred laws of spiritual science to catalyze and inspire me to develop a high consistent state of ethical, moral, principle, and valued expression. Well, guess what? The body is very different. It's about waking up. And in the emotional body, it's about increasing your consciousness, right? Your consciousness, your consciousness your connection to everything around you because the emotional body is about connection and so i know people have desires to attain enlightenment through meditation the challenge is that will never happen because light doesn't live in the mind right light lives in everything in the fabric of everything that's ever been created in the beginning god said let there be light Without light, there is no creation. And so enlightenment is me being aware, self-aware, and then taking heartfelt action to the benefit of myself and those around me equally for the purpose of the intent for which God created me. And every soul is unique. Every body is unique. Every, every fingerprint is unique. Every ear is unique. Every eye is unique. Think about that. We have seven plus billion unique people at every level of existence. Now, you want to talk about complex that's also simultaneously simple. Like, look at the data, look at the information, and never ignore or always put attention on gratitude. Because the more gratitude that I'm able to access, the more I'm able to hold in my container. So if my gratitude is small, what God puts in my container is small. If my gratitude is great, what God creator, spirit source puts in my container is great. So if you want more, increase your gratitude. When you increase your gratitude, you change your attitude. And when you change your attitude, you serve powerfully. Because now you're in the service of others and self equally. And, you know, serving self, feminine. Serving others, masculine. Loving others, masculine. Loving self, feminine. Most humans suffer from what? A lack of self-love. Right? The masculine aspect of love is hard, is charging hard down the road, but the feminine aspect of love, loving me, doing the things that um, I'm vested in, enrolling others into my vision to manifest what I feel has value and importance to humanity. You know, these are high states of function. And the most important thing for anyone who's struggling is to 
find some level of self-love, some level of encouragement that you give yourself. For every time that you catch yourself, that you catch yourself, you may say this 20 times a day, God, I'm stupid. But if you catch yourself once or twice, take the time to reframe that thought and ask yourself a basic question. Is it true? Am I stupid? And you know what your body's going to tell you? Hell no. No. You're actually quite intelligent. So what's true about what I said? Well, you're upset about the outcome. Oh, okay. So I'm stupid translates to I'm upset about the outcome. Now I'm in the know. And now I can change and I can be with myself. Wow, man, I'm really upset with this outcome. And now that I say that, I can give myself some encouragement. Look, buddy, you can do this. You can make this better. Let's go back to the drawing board and do it again. Okay, I can do it. Now I'm moving into a state of self-love versus harsh critique through violent communication with myself. And so the first step is stop the violence, right? Learn to love who you are, because when you do, you have to understand that everything's connected. Everything is connected. Everything. So when you're disagreeing with the outcome, you know who you're competing with? You're competing with the collective mind. You're competing with the collective soul. You're, complete, you're competing with the solar system. You're competing with the galaxy. You're competing with the universe. The outcome and the result is reality. What you want it to be is a fantasy until you make it manifest. Okay? So when you reach a certain level of self-awareness and wakefulness and consciousness and enlightenment, you realize there's no need to compete with God. Why would you ever want to do that? The potential energy that you have, it's too small. Rather than compete, why don't you ask for support? Hey, I wanted a different outcome and I'm confused why this isn't working out the way that I want. Well, ask God, hey, how come this isn't working out the way that I want? You know what you'll get? You'll get a very direct, clear answer. Yet, in order for you to do that, you'd have to have some sense of self-awareness to even know that you're bothered most people are bothered all day long and they have no idea that they're bothered because it's become a normal state of being for them well what would i tell that 42 year old guy i'd say look reduce your tension and your stress through these very simple practices and you know spend 15 to 20 minutes a day removing tension and stress and distortion and by the end of the week, you're going to start to feel a lot better. And you're going to have more options available to you than the limited options that you have now. And if you do the same thing for four weeks, you're going to build a whole new pattern. Because your brain will have recognized and your brain is your crown chakra. Your brain is your connection between you and source, between you and God, between you and the universe. Right? You want to build your brain or you want to damage your brain? And so you have to rebuild the body from the inside out by removing massive amounts of tension, stress, and distortion. And if you're brave enough to ask someone in your field for help, and if you don't have anyone you trust, ask the collective mind to communicate with you, right? Ask source consciousness to communicate with you. Because sometimes humans have been through things that are so tragic that it has worn away and eroded away all of their trust. And so they're only left with self-reliance. And again, I took that state of self-reliance to its edge. Wow. <clears throat> well, again, that was another beautiful and profound uh, answer i could say you're like an audio book i could sit and just you know listen to you all day you've got the cadence and the voice and the wisdom 
This has been really profound. I could chat to you probably for a few days straight, just asking you a simple question, getting a beautiful answer with story weaved in. Um, but if is there anything that you wish that we had discussed or that you want to share with the listeners before we close this show? I think the thing I want to share with the listeners is you and I are going to have some more profound conversations. And we're going to go deeper and add more opportunities for them to hear, you know, more depth, build more context, have a deeper understanding and be able to take simple actions that produce profound results. And that's all it's about. Like, imagine if a God created a body that was emotional, physical, spiritual, and energetic. Wouldn't a God create simple solutions for something they've mastered? Or would they create complex solutions? No, a human would create complex solutions for things that are very simple, right? But a God would create very simple solutions for complex problems. Why? Because they're a God. <laughs> Okay, so trust that you're on earth for a reason that's greater than you know right now and will continue to be revealed a little more every single day. And if you're putting good energy into the world and into yourself equally, you will experience a profound prophetic life. And if you choose to do the opposite, you will experience a very heavy life. And guess what? We all get to experience some level of it with you because we are all part and parcel to creation. Everything is co-created. What we eat, we co-create with our fork and our knife. We co-create with the plate. We co-create with the pots and the pans. When you go to work, you're co-creating with your car. You're co-creating with your chair. You're co-creating with your computer. You're co-creating with your phone. Everything is a process of co-creation. No one is a lone wolf you need everything around you to have your experiences even if you go into the desert by yourself you still have to sit in the sand you got to stand in the sand right like everything is dependent on everything and then once you surrender to the concept of oneness you can serve yourself powerfully because you know the good things that i'm doing for me are to the benefit of everyone the good things I'm doing for me are to the benefit of everyone. And the good things I'm doing for everyone are to the benefit of me. And the inverse is true. The negative things I do to me, I do to everyone. The negative things I do to everyone, I do to me. So what do you want to do? You want to grow through negative benefit or positive benefit. And if you're struggling and you're stressed and you're out of balance, you're obviously in a negative beneficial hole, right? But you will benefit except the path that you will be on is the path of struggle and strife. In positive benefit, the path that you're on is ease and grace. So what do you want? You want ease and grace? Or you want struggle and strife? Well, if that's what you want, reach out and get some effective support, okay? And create little pattern interrupts when you catch yourself in a stream of negativity. It's that simple. I love it. You make it sound simple and it also resonates deeply. This has been a fantastic episode. I appreciate you for coming on for your work. If people want to find you, uh, read your book, they want to dive deeper, where should they go? You should go to truebodyintelligence.com. Now, look, when you get to the website, obviously you're going to have some comments because <laughs> I'm, <the, laughs> I'm not the greatest web designer, all right? But there's information there. And one of the most important things that I think on the planet right now is to read the book Free for Life. Why? Because you have to understand the pathway to freedom. And once you understand the pathway to freedom, you're on your own. There's an audio version on my website. I put healing processes in between each chapter there's six chapters and i put something very unique and powerful at the end i wrote an amazing song called freedom that energetically 
will already start reducing your stress state and put your brain in an alpha state. And, um, you know, if you want to get in contact with me, you have to read the book first. Like you have to be willing to take a baby step and you have to be vested a little bit and jump through a hoop. And if you're willing to do that, then go to support at truebodyintelligence.com. Email me there. Christina will send you a one sheet. And we will figure out a time to get on the schedule to have a powerful conversation that I hope will be produce a profound result for you and at least give you some hope that things could be different. Amazing. I love it. This has been a treat. I appreciate you. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. We'll definitely be in touch. And just thanks, everybody, for listening. Oh, you guys are awesome. I appreciate you too, brother. All right, man. We'll stay in touch. Thanks, guys. See you later.